Welcome back to our very first episode of Tapas You Learning in 2022. You won't hear me doing a lot of talking on this specific episode and with right reason as well, because when you have the privilege of a master like Kenny Werner on your podcast, you listen. Kenny doesn't need a lot of introductions, so I'll spare you any elaborate rituals on those and let the episode speak for itself. His musicianship and art history, both as an author and a pianist, has impacted literally thousands of musicians and been a game changer in many lives, including mine. So without much further ado, we'll just move on to the conversation now. Before we move on, though, a word from my sponsors. I did code marks there. This podcast is brought to you by the holisticianoacademy.com. That's my coaching and mentorship website. It's a new venture, which is still in beta mode and one where I'm attempting to integrate my 20 plus years of experience as a professional musician and a coach slash educator and more recently certified personal trainer and counsellor. The idea is to offer a holistic form of education, 360 degree mentorship for artists of all ages and stages in their career, for not just music, but also self-care, well-being, workout routines, yoga, and of course, music lessons. Today's episode's also brought to you by every now here music.com which is my artist website i have a new piano album out my debut solo piano album in fact and uh, i'm in the midst of the promo campaign for the same and i'm just going to use this opportunity to kind of add to it check out every nowhere music.com i'm going to include a link directly to the album which you can download on all streaming platforms and bandcamp and direct from my website last but not the least this episode's also brought to you by tlwrites.com which is a very specialized freelance writing service i offer for artists and creative professionals and now moving on to an uninterrupted podcast Hello fellow beings, welcome to Tapasya Loading, a safe space to attempt honest, raw and authentic conversation in homage to the ancient act of stoking a sacred fire. Do you mind if I start recording already? No, not at all. Excellent. So, this is an honour of the highest order for me, personally. I need to get that off my chest from the very beginning. Um, I don't know how aware you are of this, but your book was a complete game changer. Uh, I'd even go as far to say a uh, bit of a lifesaver for me, musically anyway. It's the reason I didn't stop playing piano. Wow. Well, it always makes me feel so good that it happened, you know, uh, and that people, you know, in a way you don't exactly know how to receive it. So I had to grow to learn how to receive it. If that's what happened, then came. it's a cliche, but it came more through me than from me because there was no intention to write a book or, you know, so it kind of came through me. And, you know, those are the things somehow you can really trust. And it also makes music flow. I'd rather trust everything I play and play badly then play okay, because you can never play great, and try to control everything I play. That makes complete sense. You say it's cliche. It, yeah, it, it might sound cliche in today's world where so many people are talking openly about the issues that are being talked about, the relationships between mental health and music. But at the time you wrote this book, no one was talking about it. That, that's right. And certainly when I went into schools... You know, it was about you're mentally healthy if you play great and you're somehow deficient if you don't play great. And uh, you're right. But it has become quite a... It's almost like the topic of the day, isn't it? Pretty much. And um, I'm not sure how aware you are of your role as a pioneer in that specific um, niche, but uh, I can guarantee you on behalf of me and a lot of colleagues that um, the debt we owe to you, yeah, it's uh, you made history with that one. Look at that. I should have the alarm off. No worries. Thank you. I really appreciate no. that. No, thank you. Um, I start off usually uh, with a, a bit of a reminiscence on my first memory of my guests, uh, some of whom I've had the honor of meeting in person. In your case, I haven't had that, uh, not in 3D anyway. 
Mm. But um, my first memory of you uh, was um, on uh, on TV coverage of uh, a concert in Europe. Uh, this was during my time um, uh, growing up in India as well, where we'd get illegally transmitted uh, transmission of concerts uh, somewhere in the West. And I can't remember the band you were playing with, but uh, what I uh, remember very well is this is a pretty um, dense number with, um, it wasn't a regular jazz uh, setup. There were, there were a couple of percussionists playing as well. And you were banging the side of the piano with your left hand while playing something with your right. And at the time, I was doing an apprentice, apprenticeship with a Latin percussionist who would keep telling me about how I need to work more on my biological time and not be way too much in my head, which is something piano players do a lot. And I was like, wow. Very good. Thank you, right? I mean, unfortunately, he's passed on, but uh, his spirit lives on. And I remember now, now, finally, this is probably what he was talking about. Now, you were the first person I saw a pianist who was actually doing it. You were literally playing the piano, not just like a piano, but its connection to the rhythm at a biological, spiritual level was so apparent in what you were doing. Well, you have to be able to nice sing. I never thought about your biological rhythm. I'm always telling people, you have to move rhythm from the head, which tries to be rhythmic, into the body. And I use muscle memory and motor skill. And that means you practice certain things a lot longer because you don't want to just be able to play them. You want them to play themselves with that imagery. That's If you're watching your hands and they're playing rhythmically, but on a total level, different level than if you're hoping that your hands play rhythmically. Then rhythm is still outside of you. But biological rhythm is a great term. I'll steal it. <laughs> please do, please do. Uh, I wish I could take credit for it, but it's been talked about by drummers uh, for a while, actually. Um, I'd be super curious on your earliest memories of music. You talk about it a little in Effortless Mastery. Um, but that's always something I'm curious about. What is your earliest memory of music? Well, my earliest memory is uh, in dancing school, actually. I would go to mm. dancing school, I think I was three or four. I don't remember if I asked to go to dancing school, but I did go to dancing school. And uh, I always want, I think, I want to go back to tap dancing at some point when I retire. I just want to tap dance, you know. But, wow. so I, then, but I remember... Getting up on, uh, I was much more of an entertainer because where I grew up in Long Island, I started by dissing Long Island, which a lot of my friends don't like. But it was, I was not exposed to any culture, but we had a lot of television on. So I would get up on a chair and pretend to be a, an opera singer. Wow. And I'd be here, here, I got a little, like, you know, four year old, five year old. And, uh, or I did invitations of, characters my first experience where i said I, I i did write about it in my book we went to a friend's birthday party down the block and his father played piano for us i had never i'd seen people on television play piano but i had never seen a piano played in that room and i think i must have had my nose right there and i don't know what happened but my best recollection is i went home right after that and said to my parents or my mother get me a piano Wow. Yeah, my experience was much more doing it than listening to it. Interesting. That's also a little bit. Nothing came along and said, I got to do that. It was, we, she got the piano, and I would plunk out songs that I knew. I said this in the book, but then I went into the kitchen, and I said to my mom, Mom, good news, I won't be needing those piano lessons. <laughs> I figured out how to play. Yeah, I remember that one. Yeah, but I would say that I started in this, you know, what you believe is the harder you believe it, the more it becomes a reality. So I pretty much believe that all the way through. Mm -hmm. So with a lot less work than people are used to doing, things would just kind of come to me until I hit that wall where when you go to a music school, everybody there was special at some point. Now they're there. And then I had to own up you know what at this from this point on if i don't find some way to work on it um i will probably be locked in this particular point 
And when you start to work on music, it does open the door for possible less, uh, less value, less self-value. So the big problem with music is that people will often value themselves by how they play music. And that's a complete delusion. So in other words, I like to say, I would never value my life by something as insignificant as how I play a musical instrument. And yet the irony is music is um, one of the most honest, truthful connections to what life can be, right? A reflection. Potentially. Most of the time, it's a mirror for narcissists. Interesting. Well, not the people that we revere, mm -hmm. but all the others. The people that we revere, that's 2% of the people who play. A lot of other people are in a sort of a purgatory of their own creation. I played good today, I have more value. I played bad today, I have less value. I feel, um, you know, they live in a very small world of self-evaluation, and you, you can never get to what you just... Truth in music, here's the truth in music. There's nothing more to it. Mm -hmm. I play that note with complete self-support. That's the truth. And if I think it should be something else, that's the uh, narcissist... Oh, maybe I should sound different, you know. So I was never too troubled with that growing up. Then I, I can't really tell you what I listened to to change me. It didn't really change me until I went to Berkeley. I started studying jazz with everybody else, and I thought it was just a lot neater what was the sounds in there. Mm -hmm. And I was already kind of playing jazz, but there were things I didn't know, and I just happened to enter the right level where that's what they showed me. How do you voice a chord with five notes, not four notes, you know? But I never was, um, and I'm unusual this way, I was never unsure of what I was saying. I felt that I had a great power to bring the audience into what I was doing. And I don't think it was about music. It was about the emotional need to seduce them, for them to be right there with me. And so that every little move changes what's happening in their system. And I think that's always been a You know, some musicians... They, they, they work in a, in a closet. It's all about working out the music. For me, when I went out to play, I felt this uh, allure to sounds. And if I felt the allure, then I was pretty sure that the audience would follow me in. That's beautiful. I can't say it's the purest motivation, but what it freed me of is the usual limitations. Mm -hmm. Because it's really not helped. You may love and revere music, it's actually not that good to do it as right as you're about to play. Because then you feel like this, am I worthy? And this is all delusion. Music is, music is sound. Sound is vibration and we are vibration. So we're already music. Yep. And I know we all believe it or some of us believe it, but getting out of the way, touching this instrument without the slightest notion of consequences is actually closer to the truth than the truth we talk about. Wow. May I request you to elaborate a little more on that, please, sir? Yeah. Um, if, you're, if music dictates to you your value, that's a lie. Isn't it? I hear you. I'm trying to... You hear decide. me. That's a very honest answer. That's good. You're not there, but you did hear me. That's great. That's good self-reflection. I hear you, but can that possibly be true? Well, so I would say... I believe, I actually believe it's true. I'm, I'm just, uh, it's, the wordplay is tricky. So if I said to you, TL, yeah. when you um, play, what are you trying to do? I said, well, I really want to sound good. Like that's important in some kind of way, right? Yeah. I say, well, if, if we transpose it to conversation... TL, when you talk to me, what's your goal? Man, when I talk to you, I really want to sound good. Mm -hmm. It totally changes the focus. Yeah. So why is it different in music? There is a, I mean, the Sanskrit words, as we are, you guys are in India, Maya yeah. really comes to mind when it comes to music. The Maya of music. I wish I could write a whole book on it. I'm not even sure I can write an article of it. Please do. But one of the is that it's somehow more important than everything else. Music. That's not true at all. The only, you know, closest to truth would be the most important thing is your breath. 
much more than music, you know, and many other things, you know. So what is truth? You know, you can build something in your mind. Here's the thing. We don't all have to be on the beam with truth, but whatever you believe doesn't make your life flow more or does it make your life flow less? So if you believe music is difficult, does that help you get inspired or does it get in the way? Definitely gets in the way. Yeah, of course. If you believe music is easy, then you expect to own it because it's easy. Now there's a step in between. It's unfamiliar. It seems hard. But your belief system is that music is easy. So you expect that illusion to be disappearing as you become more familiar with the subject. And that's positive practicing. I need to practice rhythm more because I still think it's touch and go. Mm. The fact is, rhythm is easy. When I'm when I realize it when I play, I'll be done with that lesson. Yep. Yeah. So not only is uh, there is such a thing as objective truth. I mean, could anybody argue your breath is much more important than music? Nobody could argue that. Yeah. There are some truths that you'd have to be, you know, non-functional to to not see, right? Mm -hmm. But then there are truths that you choose to believe, and you can't exactly prove that's called faith. Now, there's a lot of places where faith is applied. Faith can be a truly wonderful thing and can be a truly terrifying thing. It depends on what the group has faith in. Indeed. We've seen examples of both. But once you realize that there are things you can have faith in that make music consistently a more fulfilling experience, then you don't want to test its truth. You want to build your faith. Mm. For example, if I believe that when I let go, music comes through me, uh, there might be a machine yet that can measure that, but maybe not. I know a different part of my brain lights up. But, you know, when we start to get into that kind of stuff, maybe our whole notion of God and the entire history of human beings is just a different part of your brain lighting up. Yep. You know? I mean, what we call a, a, a spiritual epiphany might just be a different part of the brain and who knows why who knows why what happens happens my point is who cares that's a very good question i don't understand it but i do want to yield to it because it plays better than i do mm -hmm. or also it lives better than i do yeah you know it took a long time to reconcile this with life i could complicate my life uh and never complicate my music yeah so i said whatever i know about music I got to move this into the life experience, and I will admit it took a hell of a lot longer. But I do feel very close to that way in my life. Why would I, you know, if I notice? Let's, for for example, when you improvise, it's already a success. Now you may believe that, but if I asked you now to improvise, you wouldn't. Oh, great! Because no matter what I play, it's a success. Mm -hmm. Now that's tricky, right? Yeah. I want to believe that for a very simple reason. If I believe that the act of improvising is already its own reward, I'm probably going to play better all the time. Yeah. So sometimes you believe something for the effect it has on what you want to do. I remember I took a course many years ago, and this guy wrote a book, and one of the things that stayed with me, he said the Olympic broad jumping team. Mm -hmm. They used to have a visualization coach, and the visualization coach told them to imagine that their arms and legs were really like six feet long. So now you have a group of athletes envisioning something that you absolutely know is not true. Mm -hmm. But by buying into it, they all beat their own performances. Yeah. So there's so many angles, TL, that you can look at this from. Yeah. But the bottom line is, you know, Everybody that plays music will take enough philosophy that will help them play better. And they would, you know, the general rules that people play are very focused on wanting to play better than they do. So if I'm mentioning something that is very close to the truth, but I'm also saying it helps you play better. If you were to believe that the act of improvising is already its own reward, it would change your playing today. The problem is the thing you have to change is not your playing, it's your mind. And that's why most of the exercises are geared towards the mind. Uh, even if you say, yeah, but I need more dexterity. Practicing effectively or ineffectively means that there has to be a certain adjustment 
in the mind. Otherwise, the practicing can be just tedious and a waste of time. Yeah. Or that every one thing you practice can have a positive effect on the client. It really depends on your mind. In that way, I have learned so much from Kashmir Shaivism, Jainism, you know, if you want to say Hinduism, I don't, didn't study as a religion, mm -hmm. but what they brought to America was the spiritual heart of all that stuff, which is great. Yes. I wish they would do that with Judaism and Catholicism. Just forget all the dogma. Give us the spiritual heart of it, because every person can work on that and widen their experience of anything, including their music. Yeah, I completely agree. That's actually one of the aspects to your um, um, to your um, school of thought I was very curious about, especially at the time Effortless Mastery came about. For me, um, uh, with someone with roots in South Asia, it was the first time I heard someone addressing that link between the intuitive, I'm being conservative with my terminology here, the intuitive and the cerebral, um, especially, uh, and, the, and the fact that Eastern philosophies have been privy to that connection the whole time. When I first moved to Europe to study at a conservatory, it was a bit of a culture shock to me primarily because everything was cerebral and the intuitive was, uh, at least the institute I went to, was just completely, it's like... Any time I'd even gently try and address it, it would be dismissed as woo-woo, which is why having that book in my hands a couple of years later was redemption. I was like, wow, so I'm not, I'm not, you know, all that crazy after all. I'm not a complete moron. There are the people who have been privy to that connection as well, who are not necessarily practitioners of a niche music like Indian classical music. Well, I think it's more effective to look at it as a principle of life than to just mean it's real because it's real in music. Absolutely. Well, you just said it. I feel like a f whatever you said, I feel an idiot to everybody else. Has nothing to do with how you play music. No, I mean, you're either an idiot or you're not. It has nothing to do with how you play music. You make it sound so simple. <laughs> we feel if we put ourselves down enough, we might be motivated to get it together. Yeah. If that really worked, then I'd recommend it. You know, TL, you're not putting yourself down enough. If you really, really just discredit yourself completely, you're really going to work on it and you're going to get better. But what Effortless Mastery just noticed is what's happening. It's usually the opposite. Yeah. People that are always discontent with what they do have the most trouble adding anything to it. And they have the most trouble even playing what they can play. Mm -hmm. See, I think first a person's got to get their bearing on playing to play and judge and criticize is closest to the thing where I would ever use the word a sin. Mm -hmm. Music has been given to you and you're going to use it to uh, measure your validity. You know, what a, a, a yet another human waste of wonderful gifts that already exist so true you know that's like doing to your creativity what we do to the environment so true you're trampling so on with controls that shouldn't even be your concern so if that's the case how do we build an inner acceptance that's not so vulnerable to how we play mm -hmm. because if we've developed this inner acceptance we will play better yes I mean, I always ask in my first clinic, think about a time you really need to play well. How'd you play? Horrible. And everybody almost says that, you know, that's what that emoji is for. Yeah. And then I say, when you didn't care that much or you didn't think there were consequences or you were playing with friends or if you're a little older, you were playing a bar mitzvah and no one was listening. And even, at, you know, when you were convinced this didn't, wasn't important, how'd you play? Everybody says better. Yeah. So that common experience among all the people now i don't know how many thousands i might have posed posited that to but it's like 99 and 99 and 99 100 percent mm -hmm. one guy said he didn't and actually i know him he actually didn't have that but most people have that so if that's true when you really at the top of your expectations and your respect for music and who's in the audience and blah 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 that makes you play badly and when you try, and then when you don't try, you play better. Then I say to the audience, 
Isn't that great that you just found that out? Now that you know that, you're never going to try again, right? Mm -hmm. Now that you know that trying makes play worse, you would never do it again, right? And usually there's some nervous laughter. And now we've begun the discourse on you may know something is right, but you may be neurologically disposed exactly. to the old idea, yeah. even if you know it's a lie. Yeah. So and now we start to talk about the steps. Yeah. Right. The steps are a way of touching the instrument and watching your state of mind or watching your breath. And as soon as it literally is training the mind the way you train a dog, because as soon as you start to think this is really working and you start to go, you know, it's about playing soft or as soon as you think you drop the hand. Yep. So you really are training your mind to say, my state of mind is more important than the music. Yes. And that exercise alone, I've gotten many written testimonies of people that, Played differently almost immediately. Don't get, you know, the power of this. A lot of people are entertained by the first part of the book because I bring up a lot of situations. So, how did he know I do that? Yeah. That's exactly what I do. Yeah. Was he a fly on the wall? Mm -hmm. But they don't realize I didn't just pass the problem. I gave the answer a deprogramming and a reprogramming, if you're is necessary. And that is those four steps. The first step, and before that, I posit the idea of the space. Mm -hmm. So if you want to be able to deal with all this stuff, you have to find a place where all that mental noise just doesn't happen. So I have compartmentalized it. Let's say the world of thoughts, it's in this room. And it could be like a thousand, you know, a, a million worms because all these little thoughts and you have to negotiate with all of them. And I've already given up negotiating with them because they're smarter than I am. But I start to go, all right, here I am in this world of what if and how do I do this and that? And I go, wait a minute, that never ends well. I usually end up heavy. And what am I doing? I'm actually ruining this moment. Yeah. So how many moments have I ruined trying to figure out the future or undo the past? And how many moments, how many years? How much of my life was I present for? And now this gets into very ancient philosophy. You mm -hmm. could say Buddhism or whatever. I don't really like to think of it uh, as a study. I can think of it as common sense. Yeah, I agree. You know? Yeah. So if I touch the instrument, I want to train my mind to at least at first not react to what it plays. And as soon as I do, I actually drop my hand. My mind goes, well, what's happening? You're supposed to care about me. No, you're in my way. The hands play better than you do. Oh, yeah. I like to say, yeah, and they do. Yeah. Because there's no, the uh, circuitry is direct. The hands don't have an ego. All they know how to do is whatever you've let them learn to do. So they just go to it. And so you play with like 50% less effort than you had to because you realize it's not you, it's your hands. Or it's your voice or whatever. So the first thing is the deprogramming is whatever grips you whenever you do play, if you're practicing this step, as soon as it does, you drop your hand. No, at these exercises, not for the rest of your day or the rest of your life, but in these exercises, if my mind re-enters, I drop my hand. I am teaching my mind to sit like a dog. Sit. Now I'm going to play. It's sitting. Then it might even say, wow, everything sounds so good like this. The next thing you do is try to make it sound good. No, got my hands. Go sit again. Mm -hmm. And this exercise has this exponential effect on your playing when you're not looking for it. There are many places where you can get sabotage again, like, wow, I felt such freedom. Now I'm going to go to the gig and expect that. Mm -mm. Sabotage. Experience the freedom completely in the exercises. Then forget about them and just go do what you do. You may notice that your reactions are changing. And that's the principle of effortless mastery. We don't practice stuff and then try to carry it into our life. We practice something stuff and forget about it and see the effect of it in our life. And isn't that what meditation and chanting is? Absolutely. You don't Absolutely. meditate because you're going to go drive your car to work and meditate. And you don't chant because you're going to go to a meeting at business and chant. Chanting and meditation, two things that have no relationship to anything else you're going to do. Yet, if you do find the key, you find everything else has changed. 
stuff that you weren't even had nothing to do with meditating. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that that works for everybody, but that's the idea. I had to make something that was even, so, it's grown a lot since you, since I wrote the book. So therefore it's grown a lot since you read the book and my new book, which I'm sure Vivian and I told you about, yeah, we'll talk I about think that. reveals a lot more of the compelling evidence of you want to be in this moment. And to do that, you have to practice releasing consequences because I find worrying about your playing to be a consequence yeah. I find that worrying about tomorrow is a consequence. Now, I was able to do it in music when I was nine, but I wasn't able to do it in my life till I was after over 60. Mm -hmm. I said, I know this truth, but life seems like I can't let go. And then somewhere along the way, I just said, I don't know, the integration happened. So if I'm thinking now, well, I have a lot of work coming up, but now the new strain of the pandemic, oh, maybe all the work's going to cancel. And I feel it in my body. I'm trying to control the future because I want to be safe. You actually want to play good because you want to be safe, meaning safe from your own self-criticism. In that yeah. case, I want to know I'll have enough money. Now, as soon as I go that way, and I wasn't able to do this many years ago, I go, oh, here I am. Oh, I'm going down that road, which I lovingly call the shithole. <laughs> okay. This part of your brain is the shithole. Yeah, uh, here I go. Familiar. I think many times, I'll say, hmm, that never ends very well. Yep. I think I'll watch myself breathe. And I've boiled it down to that simple thing. And over a few years, it's become a trigger that just stops the thinking. And then from that space... I can choose to do something. I can choose to practice. For example, from your conscious mind. I mean, see, all the lessons, my book is called Becoming the Instant. Mm -hmm. Lessons in Self-Mastery from Music to And that's exactly what it is. I'll give you a musical example. When you go to practice, how many things are in your head that you think you have to practice? Eight, 11, five, maybe you're out of school, so it's only four or six. Now, as you start practicing, you're aware of all those other things. So you're not really tuned into the thing you're practicing. Not only that, you're trying to convince yourself that you already have it so that you can move on to the next thing. Mm -hmm. So you're skimming the subject and you're leaving it prematurely and you're all tense and anxious because in your mind, you have six things to cover. Now, that's from the conscious mind. From the space... There's only one thing to practice, the next thing that's in front of your eyes. And while you're doing that, there's nothing else because it's all behind that. So if I could give you a sense of proportion, the way the ego goes, it's like taking a picture with a panoramic view. You are seeing all the things you need to work on. And it's almost making you unable to focus on any one of them. From the space, you like stack the deck. They're like this. There's only one thing you're looking at. And while you're working on it, you're not bothered by these things. And when you think you've worked on that enough for today, oh, now I'm still working on one thing, but it's this thing. Mm -hmm. Now, whether you take it from the ego or from the, con uh, from the space, whether you're a person that worries about all the things they need to practice or a person that can really just see I'm in this now, so there's nothing else in the universe. No matter which one you are, how many things can you practice at a time? one right whether you obsess about the rest of it or not you still can only practice one thing at a time therefore doesn't it make more i mean it's a no-brainer you just not to be answered isn't it better if you were present for the one thing because even if you were thinking about the six things you still can only do one thing that lesson is a lesson in practicing so instead of being overwhelmed by all the things you have to practice and maybe not practicing at all because you don't know where to start. Now you know, I'm going into the space first, which just means for me in the simplest way, connecting with the fact that you are breathing, not even a spiritual implication. You're breathing right now. You've been breathing all your life. And I had to make it simpler and simpler until I could do it. 
And that's what's grown a lot since I wrote the book. And there's a long story as to why that even happened with some damage and with some bad stuff going on. But I learned and then I applied it and I've whittled it down to this. There's a gizmo in you and it breathes, right? Something in you, some part of the machinery, it breathes. So now for let's just say a half a minute, just watch it breathe. Go. And if you're only watching it breathe, I don't mean watching it breathe and going, oh, what does he mean by that? Or, you know, just watch the breathing thing breathe. And it has to be for a short time. I'll explain why. And stop. Now look, look at the change in you. Yeah. No one would have expected that that kind of transformation could be so easy and meaningless. Yeah. Because I think once it becomes meaningful, we have a harder time doing it. Absolutely. It's really easy to say, look, for half a minute, are you breathing? Yeah. Watch yourself do it. It has all the meaning and difficulty of looking out the window. And yet, it stops thinking. The more you're into that, the more it stops thinking. Now, from there, that space, you start to become acquainted with that space. That's actually who I am. Not this candy coating of this myriad of problems that if I can negotiate them or convince myself that I've solved them, you know, this incredibly complex world can be stopped, but not for too long. If I said, let's meditate for five minutes, I know I couldn't stop thinking. But if I said for a half a minute, just watch yourself breathe. I'm there. So I have whittled it down to something that nobody could fail to do if they just remember how easy it is. The value of it, I wouldn't think about because it's got to, if I was, even when you play and you're going, eh, eh, you go, it's the same thing where you take a rest. Mm -hmm. So this short thing. So I've always been able to do it in music. Let's say I'm playing Carnegie Hall and everybody's so aware. Wow. We're playing Carnegie Hall. And I go, I might now I'm so convinced that music is not important on that level. Like where am I playing? It's Carnegie Hall, but across the street is a restaurant called the Carnegie Deli. Mm hmm. If I had no reaction to which one I was playing in, I'd play the best that I could ever play because there's no consequences. Has that been a headspace you've always been a master of? Or is it something you trained? I think I've been a little susceptible, but I could count it on the two hands and two feet, I would say. Most of the time I knew it, but the weird thing is, why can I explain it if I didn't have that problem? And I'm not really sure, but I was gifted with a way to put it in terms. And I wasn't looking for it. Look, some people saw me. Well, you know, if you remember my story, I won't go through it all in the podcast. But, you know, I had a teacher in Boston, Madame Sharloff. Mm -hmm. She was all about light, you know, and learning to play one note without and defying gravity. I don't think I even got it, but it influenced my thinking. Yeah. Then the guy in Brazil had, I'll just real short, you know. No, please go for it. Well, he was a great classical player, but he had a nervous breakdown. So he started to uh, practice a little exercise his teacher in Vienna gave, just going like this. Doesn't matter what the notes are. In one hand, then the other hand. And then he'd walk away. And he slowly built that up to 10 hours a day of practicing, but with the same ease that he just did that. Yeah. So when I met him, I really thought, wow. He would be playing lists, and when I looked at him, if you looked at him and not the hands, you wouldn't know he was playing it. Wow. Now, you can see that in a lot of people. You see it in Bill Evans when he plays. You can see it in a lot of players that they have digested what they're doing so well that it does it itself. In fact, it's almost the only way to explain that kind of virtuosity. It has to be in the body of the person, and then it's always there. You start to play, it starts to do that, you know? Mm -hmm. So this is where I had my epiphany. He said to me, or oh, if you're going to study with me, I want you to just do this in the right hand. I 
love that. And, and then walk away. I said, wait, 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 you mean why I can't play? Don't play anything. But every time you go to the piano, just do that. I didn't know this was going. And he said, for two weeks, I said, oh, my God. You know, all my ego stuff, you know, went into, you know, overload. Two weeks. That means I won't be the greatest player two, until two weeks later. Or, you know, all the dumb things we think about, you know. Mm -hmm. But then I had a call to play a party after six days from a beautiful woman in Brazil. And I said, well, you know what? I'm going to go play hooky. And I just went and played this party with my friend, this saxophone player. And I started to play TL, and this is where it happened. I went, what is going on here? I am not choosing these notes. The hand's just nowhere to go. So it started as a, really, when you break it down, it's neurological. Mm -hmm. When you stop holding onto the fingers for dear life and holding onto your identity, I'll, I'll give you my identity when you tear it from my cold, dead hands, you know? Yeah. When you have had six days where this is all you did, then you dropped the lid and walked away. I got surprised without the usual tyranny of my mind. My hand started to play. Now, here was the most convincing thing. They played better than I do. Wow. Well, this was a real epiphany. From that day on, TL, I never changed philosophies anymore. Because A, I wasn't the kind of guy that could push myself to practice for eight hours. And B... As soon as I got overwhelmed, I would go back on the couch. But this demonstration, which is almost metaphysical, was enough for me to say, whatever this is, I want this. So then for the next seven or eight years, I practiced it quietly myself when I went back to New York. But when people saw me play, they'd say, how are you doing that? And I said, doing what? Well, it doesn't even look like you're playing. I said, really? And then finally, I was playing with Archie Shep. And we did a, a documentary that featured him and Bill Dixon and Cecil Taylor called Imagine the Sound. And at one point they recorded, they videoed uh, a session we did in a studio. It was the first time I'd seen myself play in a video, maybe ever. And I see myself, I'm sitting there like this and the hands are going like that. And I'm going like, wow, what I'm saying, like, who's doing that, you know? I really didn't. I got to a point where people wanted what I had. So you pay me, I gave you a lesson. And when I started to talk, I didn't feel any more responsible for the things I was saying than I did for the things I was playing. But they were right on target. So I'd say, right there, you you cared about playing. Like, first of all, no one ever talked about that. And playing Stella, you know, Stella by Starlight, you cared right there. I did. How do you know that? So I don't know. I could feel it. I saw it. I, heard, I don't even think I heard it. I saw it. And at that moment, the music went down. If caring made the music go up, we wouldn't be having this conversation. But caring makes the music go down. If you're grooving and you go, wow, I'm really grooving, usually that's the end of the groove. Even noticing it. So what you want to do is be in a position to receive whatever's happening. Whether you're receiving from without, within, from God, Charlie Parker, or Charles Manson, it really doesn't matter. But the notion of receiving means the mind stays at bay and allows the body to function and do what it knows. It also gladly accepts what it doesn't know. Instead of the musician trying to rationalize that they know more than they think they do, because it hurts whenever they, it's a whole integrated thing. It hurts every time they realize they can't do something. So they try to convince themselves they could do it. And in that way, rob themselves of the experience of learning to do it. You know, how good is your rhythm? So I say, how good is your rhythm? He goes, pretty good. Uh, you know, that's complete rationalization. Mm. If your rhythm is there, I say, play it, and your hands will start playing rhythm. But when we, instead, you would play, and it's not rhythmic. Oh, damn it, I suck. This is all wasted energy. It takes you so far away from this two things in music. Practicing for the possibility of adding more information to what you play. But the playing... You want to practice receiving, if not even being grateful, what's coming out, because that makes you play better. And when that other stuff that you're practicing is ready to go, you'll notice your hands are starting to do something different. Now, that's for an improviser. For a classical player, it's like this. You want to practice different spots, stay out of the way until the hands know how to do it. 
And even though the piece is 70 pages, there are spots when once you've committed it to the hand, Scott, you don't have to do it. You find other parts of the piece is going better. But you see, you're practicing mastery. You're practicing programming the body to play the music so that the ego doesn't have to. Yeah. And if you want to be egotistical, you've certainly got plenty of reason to be. But the ego can serve a bad function when it hopes that you're going to play well. Those hopes are usually disappointed. I mean, dancers get it the whole time, right? They've talked about it, dancers, martial artists, or even yogis. They, they, they've always insisted the body knows better, trust it to guide you in the first place. Why did musicians forget? Well, what do you think happened? In, what happened to musicians? Because they can hear the results. Mm. Hearing the music is a big distraction. Once I start going, you see each thing leads to the other thing. Yeah. And then, you know, so if you, we could sort of dial back a little bit uh, to whatever specific questions you were thinking about. Well, uh, you, I mean, everything you say, though, is every, it's all so on point. It's hard for me to come up uh, with questions uh, which you haven't answered already. But I would, I do have a couple of burning questions. Um, your take on institutionalized education at the time you um, wrote Effortless Maskering uh, was pretty scathing. Yeah, and uh, uh, you exercise the same principles you mentioned earlier on in music, wherein you literally, well, didn't give a shit in the manner, in the outspokenness with which you addressed these issues. Yeah, I'd have been pretty uh, reckless there. No, but I loved it, when, which is why I think it resonated with so many people in the manner it did. And it reflects a, some kind of major catharsis the writer had gone through. So I'd be super curious on what this catharsis was. Well, there's a couple of funny stories around it. First of all, there was a chapter in there mm -hmm. about education. And when I had Jamie Abisol, who, who released a book, yeah. you know, it's a big education yeah. publication thing. He almost invented this stuff. Yeah. So he had other academics editing my book, looking at it, and everybody was loving it until they got to that chapter, and they felt the need to defend their universities. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, we don't do that, and blah, 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 blah. And I'm thinking to myself, well, it doesn't really matter whether they're right or wrong. The problem is if they feel threatened, they probably there's much more in the book for everybody than really nailing the educational system. So I wouldn't want them to keep their students from reading it because it also maybe nails them. Mm -hmm. So I took that out. I, someone asked me the other day, do you know where it is? I have to look around. It would have to be in an old drive or something. But it was pretty bad. And then on record, in some video, I mean, I went to Berkeley and I kind of gave a scathing thing. Mm -hmm. And then when they were thinking of hiring me, this one woman said, didn't you do a video back in 1997 where you really <laughs> did? School? I went, well... You know, uh, I think I was dissing the... Here, here's the deal on it. Uh, education, at least the Western-style education, is structurally con uh, constructed... Well, structurally constructed to fail, except for the most talented people. So the most talented people have been playing great, and then the school gives them a scholarship because they say when they go out for the rest of his life, yeah, he, he went to our school, you know the name of the game is overkill and over being overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. They might have had love for music that they lost. So the reason I can say that now is because my boss, the dean of the performance division, agrees with me. Actually, a lot of people have caught up with this mm -hmm. and would admit it and are already trying to change it from where, wherever they teach and however they do it. But the school actually hired me to apply the principles of effortless mastery and try to sort of pollute the pool, you know, pollute the, the gene pool, yeah. but in a good way. Yeah. Sort of spread the virus, but in a good way. Yeah. The virus of love, the virus of, you know, eliminating doubt while playing the instrument. The, 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 to be able to own some things while you just wave at others because it's being presented way too fast. Well, the way I see it, you're the medicine being injected into an infected body more like and they i think intended me to do that when i first got there i didn't have any classes just times and rooms i was supposed to go in and speak but you know of course they advertised i was there but 
how many emails are all the students getting? You know, they probably just passed. Yeah. Very often there was one or two people there. And I just started to speak. And then there were more people there. Then eventually they gave me classes. The first time at the steps of effortless mastery are now semesters. Steps one and two is semester one. And steps three and mm-hmm. four is semester. And I'm seeing absolute change of everything these students. How does that make you feel? I feel like, wow, this is a real thing. Indeed. I felt tremendously grateful when they made the Effortless Mastery Institute mm-hmm. at Berkeley, which is like the best school for a lot of things. And then they actually made a minor in Effortless Mastery, meaning along with your studies, you could take at least two credits of either Tai Chi, Qi Gong, uh, yoga for musicians, body mapping, or Alexander Technique, along with all of my courses. And then along with your major in performance, you would have a minor in Effortless Mastery. So this made it a very real thing, even more so than it was. Sounds like full circle. <laughs> um, unprepared, because it was never my goal to make anyone else's life better. But it took me a long time to accept that something that came through me just does make a lot of people's life better. And now, as I had to, it's interesting, I had to work on myself saying, why won't you receive that and accept that and love yourself for it, you know? Mm-hmm. And now it's like, there was a great, someone sent me an interview of Stephen Sondheim. Uh, if I can find it, I'll just pass on the email to you. But at the end, he talks about teaching and he almost breaks into tears. I have to memorize what he said because I can't quote it. But um, he got it. I got it now. Watching the veil lifted from the eyes of the people I'm teaching is as big a kick to me as actually playing great myself. Yeah. So all that and especially a year and a half of all that not playing with the pandemic, it's really become my solo. It's how I help someone else realize their greatness is a great uh, feeling. Like I feel, you know, you can't be sure what you're doing on this planet if it's any use at all. I used to say as a musician, we're not used to doing anything useful. (laughs) And I'm very useful because of how many people turned around. And not just in music, you find out. I get m- most emails I get is the book changed my life. Yeah, not just played. Yeah, and I'm overwhelmed. You know, I didn't, didn't work towards that, but I was chosen, or maybe whatever whatever creates that created to me. And now I can really accept it, great support, and I'm happy for the people that get it. I want you to know, this is this thing called music completely yours this is a good point to ask you a question that whole narrative of music educators being failed musicians post pandemic that entire perspective change with some of the most so-called top tier artists looking to fall back upon education as a legit means of making a living where do you think that narrative stands now post pandemic the whole idea of teachers being failed musicians oh okay that has changed Good to hear. Because the fact is, the amount of opportunities people have to play, the the current model is you protect your life and you fund your own life by being a teacher. And actually, that's the way it was. I mean, Mozart wasn't making a lot of money selling pieces, but he was teaching. Really? You know? It's a time-honored tradition, if you think about it. But... Uh, once a lot of people saw the handwriting on the wall, they were going back to get master's degrees, even PhDs, because supply and demand. Mm-hmm. Suddenly, they advertised a, a, a position. They had PhDs to choose among. But I had my experience, and I had this reputation for my playing, and from the book, which was a unique reputation. Mm-hmm. So uh, the first place I taught was a new school. And next thing you know, they wanted me to teach everything in the whole school. The next thing I was at at NYU, which was very adjunct, but the guy that run the whole thing was a student of mine in Effortless Mastery, and he really believed in it. So I had a cushy job for the amount I had to teach there. And then when my wife and I, after 60, were just discussing how much I really want to run around this world, just getting to play, I don't think I want to run around so much anymore. Mm -hmm. Well, this is before the pandemic. Mm-hmm. unless it's something special something i haven't done before i don't want to get on the train and hit the same places um and this job 
allowed me to pick and choose that way, you know? So once my wife and I decided, maybe you want to be a little open to all these people you've been helping. Mm-hmm. You know, I was having a talk. I was in a, 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 a workshop that went about a week in Ireland. And I don't know if you know the drummer, John Riley. Sure. Yeah, he's a great drummer. Yeah. And we were talking because he and I kind of came up together, uh, even playing weddings and bar mitzvahs before we were out in the world. You know, we're talking. We happened to mention Joe Lovano, you know, and and I said, well, you see, Joe really made it. He's such an icon. And John just looked at me and said, you're an icon. And I said, what do you mean? I just said it again. You're an icon. Well, how am I an icon? Because I can't play everywhere I want to just because I'm who I am. And he never explained it. Yeah. If you play in New York and because of that, they're going to write for you, write about you in the New York Times. Mm-hmm. That's a different kind of iconage, you know? So I said, what is he talking about? She said, don't you see all these people that you've helped? But they're always in my rear view. I'm not really thinking about it. I'm thinking about what I'm doing. It's just, why don't you just really own that, you know? It was one of the most important things she ever said to me. So I just emailed the president of Berkeley, who at the time was Roger Brown. Mm -hmm. I said, look, I don't know if you're interested in this. Well, first I emailed uh, uh, Downbeat Magazine. Now, I have trouble getting a review in there as anybody. There's so many records and CDs coming out. But I emailed them and said, look, I don't know if you're interested, but I am now ready to build on what I created with Effortless Mastery. Amazing. Get an email right back. Yeah, how about you doing an article in four parts? And suddenly I was on the cover of the educational set. In other words, if I said I got a new CD, will somebody review it? I might not have even gotten an answer. Mm -hmm. But because I was ready to add to the body of knowledge of Effortless Mastery, everyone was like, sure. You know? So then I called Roger Brown at Berkeley and I said, I don't know if you're interested in this, but I decided to really co you know, own what I'm doing with Effortless Mastery. And I want to teach it Beautiful. the way I know it. Get an email right back. We'd be honored to have you here. He said, when I was in music school, I was thinking of quitting and I read your book. Yeah. Familiar story. Yeah. So the book has been the sort of jewel that has had a, an effect on my life, even in the world. When I was playing, I always had a much wider idea about music. I wasn't inside. I wasn't outside. It wasn't one record might be a trio that's playing real pretty stuff. The next record would be the craziest shit you ever heard. Mm -hmm. And someone told me from a rec company, you're always going to have trouble. I said, why? He said, because you do something different every time. I said, why would that be trouble? I think people would want that. Like a director. He's directing a, a Western. Now he's directing an urban comedy. And no, think about all the players. They have a sound and all their records for the same sound. I went, oh, shit. Well, I could never do that because I don't really play music. I play at music. Wow. And now the premise is that. And he was right. Sometimes somebody would give me a great review for my trio. And then the next record, they go, I don't know what he's doing. Mm. Because each reviewer is assigned to a certain style and they're used to and of course it's something that based on what they like so it was hit and miss and then when i wrote that which had a lot of success even by the beginning it became more and more he's not a modern player he's not a traditional player he's not an avant-garde player he's not he's the guy that wrote that book Mm -hmm. (laughs) and it gave me us they had to they could didn't know Because they didn't know what to expect, they gave me a different kind of listen because they were aware of all the stuff I had stated. So the book has been nothing but a blessing to me, not to mention how many tours it made possible. Mm -hmm. Because if I didn't have the marquee name to be uh, in the festival uh, or to do a tour, uh, schools couldn't wait for me to say, I'm coming over to do a masterclass. And the money from the masterclass financed the rest of the tour. And then the other, they all kind of came together. Of course, I have a name on a level, you know, whatever it is, but it all kind of came together. And now from teaching at Berkeley in semesters, I think it's really is unique. I am, I don't know what an author, a philosopher, but it's all, I speak two languages, music and English. I believe that the message is the same, whether I'm playing or talking. Exactly. The way I see it, I think I would like to say you're one of the earliest pioneers of what is happening in the arts industry, for lack of a better term anyways, which is 
everything's becoming interdisciplinary. It's not just music on its own anymore or visual arts on its own anymore right. or psychology on it. It's all of it is merging. And that book, you, you were one of the first examples of how to do it right. The fact that you can be uh, one of the finest pianists in the world and also an, ex an equally powerful writer. That was what was unique. The people that have written more elegant books than I have are not really great players. Interesting. And then great players tend to not be that verbal. Exactly. So for some reason, and I had to, when I thought about it, you know what, man, you're unique. It doesn't matter whether you're the best player in the world or among the top 10, or it doesn't really matter. But on the level you play, there's nobody that can explain it yeah. that plays near that. And the people that can are more authors than players. So it was somewhat unique and it's just had its own now what i try to do with my life is what i did with the music i'm not trying to anticipate the, the future and i'm not regretting the past i'm trying to be in the moment and do the next thing mm -hmm. that looks logical to do and leave the rest of it because i can't control it anyway and that's what i've been doing in music for 50 years but i've been doing it in my life progressively over those 50 years and in the last 10 years more than ever and the pandemic played a unique role by not traveling everywhere like i always was every day i woke up and it was the same what is my mind doing mm -hmm. what is my mind telling me how is it coloring what i'm seeing mm -hmm. and everything got a lot to do it every day because i wasn't going to an airport yeah. and it, my commitment to as i play i am finally fused completely yeah. i won't say there are disasters that could happen that i wouldn't react with as much fear or agony as anybody else but at least like many musicians are ruining today worrying about their playing in general yeah. they're not enjoying all the self-love they could because they're subjecting it to this test how good do i play yeah. and that varies even day after day so i can say proudly i've gotten to the point where I don't sweat the small stuff. When there's nothing wrong, there's actually nothing wrong. Amen. And it actually took me a long time to get to that, which is definitely res related to effortless mastery. And the new book is Lessons in Self-Mastery from Music to Life. Let's talk about that a little. Go ahead. Well, to start off with, effortless mastery is, uh, one, it's, it, it's, it's, your first book went to legendary status. Um, what, are we, what are we to expect from your second? And what was the inspiration behind you writing this book? What made you go back to that desk? Because I think it's related to have finally started to teach it at semesters. Mm -hmm. And then you find that the power and reach of it is so much more powerful than I thought when I wrote the first book. Mm -hmm. It wasn't just about musicians getting out of their own way. Mm -hmm. It was about life. And the more I spoke, I have never planned what I'm going to say. I trust what's coming out. And with few exceptions, that trust has always been rewarded. So the, the language just grew exponentially since I would go to a school for two days and then leave or, you know, even a week. The language grew so much, so much so much new stuff that I felt I could spill out another book just the way I spilled out the first book. The language of doing a lot, of, the reason the first book is so complete is because it wasn't the beginning of a process, it was the end of a process. I found I had this answer. Mm -hmm. I spoke the first time publicly at an IAJE, which was called the International Jazz Educators Association. Yeah. And I said something like, this is like a Star Wars convention. And everybody screamed because they were walking around under the delusion that it was so important what we were doing. <laughs> I said, well, it can't be jazz. How important can it be? Most people don't even know it exists. Why are you walking around like you think you're supposed to save the world? What you're doing is not that important. And this was like a revelation. Now, Jamie Abersold was videoing me. He used to video people at the IJE. He's like the education, you know. Yeah. And 
when I got done, he was, he's kind of a mystical guy too. He was so enamored of what I said. He started making copies of the video and sending it to people. So then I got a call from a school in California. Uh, we'd like you to come out here and, and do a, a workshop master class for the school. And of course, play for us. Because when I play, I do demonstrate. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, I would leave playing out of it because I don't want you to know that for me, it's just a theory. Mm-hmm. It's got to be real. So Indeed. I get there, create more work. Maybe I played with Peter Erskine and some Dave Carpenter uh, out there, some great players, but they were out there and had to fly a band out or whatever, you know. Mm-hmm. But then I get there and on the band directors, before the internet, on the band director's door is a quote by me. Wow. And I don't understand this yet. I'm going, what the hell? I'm, I'm not a speaker. I'm a player. I'm glad that got me out here, but I didn't really get it yet. Something was coming through me that people had to hear. Not only that, but there were people that were coming to everything and always recording what I was doing. Wow. And then I, I, they take lessons with me. They record every lesson. So much wisdom. just It popped out of my mouth like spittle. Yeah. I mean, I'm not credit for it. So it does sound weird, but it was heavy shit. What can I say? Yeah. And then I started to think, everybody's recording this thing. Somebody might write a book out of it, just the scraps. <laughs> and I said, I write a book. And I was in a particularly good place in the mid-90s where, having decided to write a book, I actually did. But all I had to do to start is, is transcribe, one of, like I did a three-day master class for the Danish Musicians Union in a beautiful place. All I did was took home those tapes and that was the start of the book. Every time I talked about a certain subject, I put it in a folder. Eventually, they become chapters. Wow. But I had that similar feeling. I've got so much to just drop on everybody again, mm-hmm. including the relevance of what this was to what everybody already found out in relig- comparative religion, in industry, in sports. It's not that I'm an expert on all those things, but these lessons, if I give them the way I knew them through the certainty of my experiences in music, they absolutely related to people's lives. I already knew that. So the book is a much wider, it's the same subject, but it's much wider. I think it's funnier. And I think there's a lot more power in it. It it reaches further, but it's still using the same principles that I'm sure of because I met those principles through the experience of music. That is amazing. So I think like effortless mastery, we'll have to see. You know, I tried giving it to a few people. Like, there's a, I have a, a guru, mm-hmm. and I don't talk about it. They don't really like people saying, oh, I do this one, that one, because you don't represent that thing. It's mm-hmm. doing 30 years. I just happen to be the right thing at the right time. And uh, so I gave it to a, a Swami, and he said I was having Spanda experiences while I read this book. Wow. And I gave it to a therapist, and she said, it changed the way I do therapy when I read this book. Yeah. Gave it to an agent, which was my biggest fear. All you ever do is present books. And I said, but did you really like it? And she said, I fucking loved it. Wow. Yeah. She said, I usually speed read these things, but I got up early in the morning, put your music on and read the book. And I said, you know, every person I gave it to, they were blown away. And I thought, yeah, maybe I did it again. We'll see. You know, but it was the same motivation. I had so much more material from what I had done since I made them classes. That I felt like if I start writing, when I get done, the book will be almost finished. I even have the chapters in mind. Much more. I didn't have to transcribe anything because by then I could write. And was this all during the pandemic? But I started it late 2016. I think, well, sh- long story short, I was going to India. I wanted to go to the mother ashram of this particular place, right? Wow, where about so uh Ganeshpuri, it's in the Mahas, what is it? Maharashtra, Maharashtra yeah, re- region. Yeah, yeah stay there yeah. too. So I figured, wow, this would be a hell of an ending for the book. I have arrived, you know, and I'm in this and I struggled while I was there, mm-hmm. being in it, being out of it, and then I found it and it was effortless mastery, but it was just me walking down the street. Life can be that incredibly fulfilling, mm-hmm. you know, and I've been for it because i never really felt that good even though i helped a lot of people feel good didn't mean i really owned it myself you know so i come back from that trip 
and I got a little confused. I should have left at least a week or two just to decompress, recopy my notes, meditate, you know, do the things I was doing. Mm -hmm. I went right to work and it got me confused real fast, yeah. you know? Yeah. And then I gig in New York and I just hung out too late. And then I started to drive home. I lived two hours from New York and I really wasn't, I didn't even get coffee on the way up. I really wonder, cause I set myself up perfectly for having a, major car crash mm -hmm. on my way back up mm -hmm. in 2007. I mean, I did everything you're supposed to do. I stayed around an extra hour when I have a two hour drive. I had fortunately only one drink. I usually would stop at the gas station and get coffee. And if I'm getting sleepy, I open the window or I pull over, but being still on India time, I didn't get that warning. Next thing I knew I woke up and I banged into one side of the road, you know, the gate, the, the fence and all the way across another side of the road, car was completely crashed i was bleeding profusely from the head and i called nine but i wasn't in pain i called 911 so I, but i felt like it was okay now i have to get another car but a week later i started to have anxiety and then it started to be so regular that i couldn't get out of bed i had to cancel gigs i had to uh i, I mean i would lay there and watch myself breathe for two hours hoping that it would subside and I actually learned how to use my breathing to keep the, to, to take, to separate from the anxiety. And then I think, okay, let's go brush your teeth. <laughs> That's all I had to think. And what the, what they told me is that sometimes with car accidents, there can be a trauma. Yeah. Yeah. PTSD. I was just trying to make it through teaching or playing, you know, medication, alcohol at night, anything I could do. Mm -hmm. To be able to squeeze an hour or two of useful. The rest of the time I was like, Ugh. then at night I would drink so much that I was actually fine. I'm thinking, just remember this tomorrow morning. It was like Groundhog Day. The next morning is like, I was paralyzed. Wow. So when I came out, pain is a great motivator. Mm -hmm. I was more steeped in the spiritual practices that I was studying that I wasn't too motivated to do. But suddenly it was the utmost motivation in my life. And as I was getting better from the trauma, I was a lot more tuned into my breath. Uh, meditation had a lot different meaning for me. I was forced to use these tools that were, right? And so I not only came out of that trauma, I went into this really golden period, 2018 and 2019. And then I was working a lot. I still really didn't get back to the book. In 19, I started to just, almost every chapter had been written. But I didn't realize how many chapters weren't finished. So I kept working through it to, to 2019. And then finally, in 2020, on March 13th, when they sent us home because of the pandemic, in about a week and a half, I finished the book because it was that close. Wow. But it would never happen if I didn't have to go anywhere. Yeah. So a book that I started in late 2016 did not take me four years to write, but I didn't complete it until... March of 2020. Hmm. Here's the other thing about Effortless Mastery. Let's say people don't feel the same way about that book. I can honestly say I will have minimal, if not no disappointment. Mm -hmm. Because I've learned a lot of lessons in my life from music. So if you have a bad performance, if you want to practice Effortless Mastery, forgive yourself immediately. Mm -hmm. If you're worried you're going to have a bad performance, Make a commitment to go out and celebrate whether it's a good performance or not. I have all these things I didn't talk about in the first book that takes away the notion of failure when it comes to music. Beautiful. Because for two reasons, it's closer to the truth that any action you take is already a success. Mm. And that fear restricts you from taking actions. Therefore, you might miss the best opportunity of your life. So all this new stuff, you know, which isn't really new, but I mean, added stuff came into the book. How do you live your life? Consider taking an action to be the success. That way you'll take a bunch of them. And even if it doesn't work out, it was a success because I took the action. All this I learned from music. And I give this in the book. And I think, but let's say the book, well, you know what? Really, it didn't really do it. We sold a few thousand copies. And I'll say, great. I, I wrote the book. That was my job. Selling it was someone else's job. I'll show up. I'm not going to wire myself into the success of the next action I take. I finally learned what I knew in music. Let the fingers do the walking. Hell yeah. Trust whatever they play, and it'll be the best you can play at that moment. I find the same is very true of life. Amen to that.
That seems like a fantastic note to taper off on gradually. But before we end, though, I have a couple of things I did want to get off my chest. One, you might be surprised at how well effortless mastery is also known in India. Amazing. Yeah, my, my girlfriend, who's an Indian classical singer and, uh, well, a contemporary Indian singer, she um, does um, play with jazz musicians too. She has a student who uh, just graduated from Berkeley. She's like, hey, I just came across this amazing book called Effortless Mastery. You know about this? My student was telling me about this. Like, yeah, I'm. Uh, he's. Uh, I'm talking to the author of this book in a couple of weeks. She. She. She was like, no way. Wow. And somebody was really getting ready, especially after I had been there, to organize a series of places to go around India and play, because that's obviously if you play and everybody's getting the same message, then it's 100% solid message. Indeed. So I would love to move around India and play concerts either with my trio probably with my trio and solo yeah i, I sincerely hope that that finds fruition it's it's a bible of yeah. sorts it's also the, the its content is just so universal it it transcends cultural idiosyncrasies really well like i say it's amazing for me to hear i don't know where it came from i'm a little jewish boy from long island i don't know why this happened but you know staying open to let it happen is something i i've come to have a, a lot of if i'm there if we're talking I won't say why. Well, now I wouldn't have to anyway because the identity is there. But think about the beginning. I'm going places to speak. If I'm coming out of my conscious mind, who do you think you are? Mm -hmm. Telling people what it's, you know. But I'm here. That's how I know I'm supposed to be here. So that's a little bit of effort. If they didn't call me, I wouldn't be here. I'm not trying to promote myself as anything. Whatever this book is, it has a great purpose. And I'm here to... Uh, serve its purpose it's been really a journey that i didn't yeah i made a phone call to berkeley and i made a phone call to downbeat but it's remarkable how few phone calls i made with people seeking me out as a result of having read the book mm. my last question is a set of three questions your words of advice to a child who's about to play the piano for the first time in his life your words of advice to someone who's about to join music college and your words of advice to someone who just took up a job as a teacher at a music college. Wow. That's, uh, <laughs> that's a lot of different stuff to a child. I wouldn't have any advice to them. Beautiful. Let her discover the instrument and then let them play something until they play it easily. So at their first orientation of music is music is easy. Beautiful. To someone entering college, I would say, try to stay within yourself and stay focused. Being in college is like being in a hurricane. There'll be stuff flying around in the air. Now is a good time to start practicing being in the eye of the hurricane. Mm. Meaning, you know what you came here for, you know what you want, and some things will be more relevant than they and some things won't. That doesn't mean you don't give your attention. Take it in, but don't take it personally. Do your best on everything else, but have an inner life that knows what it wants to do. And don't let, you know, I mean, many things I say, try not to compare yourself to others. But to do that, they may have to do the steps of effortless mastery, mm -hmm. which is specific practicing not thinking. Mm -hmm. So, you know, not quite that easy a thing to answer. And if it's going to be a teacher, I'd say, see if you can get medical insurance, retirement account. It's a security that... You won't get any other way. <laughs> <laughs> you know, be secure enough. Well, I don't know. I don't know what I'd say because it depends on what they know. Mm -hmm. I can't tell them to know what I know if they were, you know, but there are things I would say in general that are true no matter who's teaching. Cut down your syllabus as much as you can. Wow. Make little amount of stuff to do in your class as possible so that people can spend more time owning the things that you show them instead of just this cavalcade of things that they never have time to practice, which just implants the idea I'm not as talented as I thought I was. That is the dysfunction of college. So I guess I would. I'd say whatever you're going to teach, cut it in half and give them more time to actually own it. And they can believe if I can own this, I can own something else. Work contrary to the usual thing of school. The thing in America, anyway, is accreditation. Accreditation is only available with certain benchmarks, but benchmarks are totally counter helpful to the idea of learning to play. Mm -hmm. 
you know, you're not going to be at this level because they say you're at the third semester. A semester is a, a made up unit of time, yeah. like a week or a day. What do you do? You work on something. If it's fun, how did real teachers in India teach their disciples? For one thing, they were their disciples, not their students. Mm. For another thing, very often they're this, the disciple that wasn't their teacher. Very often it was also their guru. Yeah. And the teacher moved. I used to say, I think it was in the book, but it's in the new one anyway. Instead of you would be taught in the old model, you were taught by masters not people with master's degrees. Oh. And you may be playing something right, but the master recognizes that it's not in you yet, so he doesn't move you forward. So private teaching, it's much easier if you don't need the money from the parents, but you can actually teach them how to play right off the bat by staying with the material and let them have to think about it less and less. Then they think that's what playing is. Yeah. You can do the same thing in college, but you have to figure out how they get by their ratings and their juries and I've always had this thing when I went to colleges, and one of these days we're going to do it. They should get rid of the word jury. Wow, yeah. It is a universally accepted word for, like, final test, right? Yeah. How did it become a jury? When did you become possibly guilty of something? <laughs> that is so true. I never thought about that. Change the name to celebration. It's time for your year-end celebration. We are celebrating what you know. And we are uh, compassionate of what you don't know. Mm -hmm. so it's nothing but a celebration. That would change the whole concept of what education is. Because don't forget, for the 2% that become successful, uh, an overwhelming per uh, percentage don't become successful. And they become unsuccessful before they even are able to give it a try. Because they have a negative view of themselves. They doubt what they play. They fear what others think. And where did they learn that? In university. Wow. So it's not going to change overnight. But let's put it this way. If there are people that are taking uh, education courses at Berkeley and they majored in effortless mastery, the head of music in that college may want that person to come because they have the book and it's been crumpled up because they read it so many times. I was picked up so many times by head of that jazz apartments, and the book was like all bent out of shape. <laughs> I would have to say, book. He said, I read it 11 times. <laughs> so people waiting have some awareness of what, it's just time, you know, T.L., yeah. it's time. Yeah. I trust, because I believe, again, this comes more from Kashmir Shaivism or the Mahabharata or the Bhagavad Gita, you know, yeah. and I talk about it in one of the early chapters. At one point in the Mahabharata, the chariot driver brings Arjun, who's the hero, mm -hmm. into battle. He's about to battle. You know, it's a classic battle. It could be like a B movie about, you know, kingdoms and royal families. I know, right? So he's about to go battle to kill cousins, uncles. Yeah. And Arjun doesn't want to do it. Mm -hmm. I do want to kill my family. I don't want to. This is a wretched thing to do. And the chariot driver goes, Whoop! and he's a little blue man, which yeah. is the name of one of my tunes. It's Krishna. Oh. Krishna begins to instruct Arjun on how don't pay too, too much attention to this. Do your dharma. Yeah. Go, do your dharma. On another level, it's all, it's all a play of consciousness. Mm -hmm. On a level, we all know that, but the distance between here and there is a practice. A person never practices, never moves towards that idea. A person that has a practice moves incrementally, if too slow for the ego, incrementally towards less and less things being the definition of who, who I am. This happened, it didn't happen. It doesn't matter because it's all a play. Uh. You know? Now, the more you think that in music, the better you play. So even if you don't want to go into old philosophy, if I'd like the Effortless Mastery Institute, which is what we have, I'd like philosophy courses and, you know, I'd really like to t make it a whole edifice and in there is every way including musical instruction for people to attain what they already are yeah which is a drop in the ocean of god yeah that's what these non-dualistic points of view point towards right it's not so much a discovery as it is a revelation right but everybody's trip is uh, incremental and the ones that don't have the patience for it it doesn't really go anywhere Indeed. so that's where you get that language start to really be grateful for the journey yeah Unless you reach a certain end point, you're never going to take the journey. Yeah. 
it all becomes common sense. Yeah. Practice something because you can't do it. Practice without a destination. When you notice you're doing it with ease, practice something else. Yeah. And you blow down all the barriers which were made from your expectations and the pressures one puts on themselves. Unfortunately, in many cases, a university is the bridge towards that kind of ill thinking. Yeah. Let's start with you assuming that whatever your voice is, is worthy. And now it has social implications. Mm -hmm. Maybe musicians or a certain, maybe what we were all heading towards, the true shamans of this world that instruct others might be musicians. Mm. If they go all the way. Yeah. And on another level, who cares? Very true. You know, and then everything goes better. Yeah. Amen to that. Um, uh, fun fact, by the way, the Indian infrastructure for uh, music education, unfortunately, has not been quite immune to uh, some of the, well, for lack of a better term, problems you refer to, a whole different can of worms. And it's been interesting observing someone who has been straddling both cultures for most of his life to see that the common strains between the dysfunctionalities at the end of the day are really not cultural. They are human. Why do you say that? First of all, am I right when I heard that there were, if you really wanted to go through the school for to play tablas or be an Indian singer, that it was a 12-year school? Is that true in some There place? are some schools, uh, yeah, very traditionally, which even go into generations, uh, which won't accept someone as a musician unless there is a certain number of generations practicing music even. Very, very traditionally. That is more realistic than accreditation. But it's funny you said that because... You know, in America, I have kind of, I'm also trying to develop my comedy routine. Okay. When everybody's enlightened, I'm going to leave the scene and become a stand-up comedian, okay? <laughs> Believe it or not. I believe you. You know, our presidents would always say, there's a lot more that unites us than divides us. And I say, bullshit. There's, we've never been more divided. <laughs> However, one way where we're all like, ego. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We're all incredibly similar Indeed. when we under the thumb of our ego. Yes. That's the thing that unites us. <laughs> the desire, mm -hmm. as much as desire motivates, it has to be compartmentalized so that you can join this moment. What can I do in this moment that feeds those dreams? If I wonder about whether I'm going to reach those dreams, I'm wasting this moment. Yeah. Seems like a... Great note to end on. I want to respect your time. Um, I, I mean, I could go on for hours. I literally could. This is uh, an absolute privilege. Uh, Mr. Werner, I, I, I've, I've made it very clear how much of an honor this was, but I want to thank you again from the bottom of my heart for coming on. I feel you. Thank you. Yeah. I wish you all the best for the new book. I'm going to grab my copy as soon as I can. And... Um, Big, big thank you and big hug. Yeah. And you know what? When you go back to your instrument, just touch the instrument as if it was the most lovely thing in the world to touch. I will do, sir. All right. All right. All the best. Gratitude from the bottom of my heart for listening to the very end. Please consider taking a minute to subscribe to our shows so you know when the next episode is out. This is a labor of love, one I hope snowballs into one that's sustainable in its attempt to support independent thought and authentic relating. And having you as a regular member of our audience is what makes that a realistic prospect. Much love, and talk soon. Just another voice out in